Good morning, everyone. My name is Amy Gray, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the CMTA. And we're just thrilled that you're here to join us for what we believe will be an incredibly informative, educational, and engaging day. We have over 400 people registered for our conference today, people from all across the US and around the world internationally, as far away as Australia, Egypt, and across Europe. So welcome to all of our international guests as well. One of the aspects that makes these conferences so special is the opportunity to connect with fellow CMTers. And although we're not meeting in person, we're meeting virtually, our teams worked really hard to make this as engaging uh, and interactive as possible. So we have some sessions planned where you can connect with one another over the breaks and over lunch. So we really encourage you to participate in those and we'll be giving you directions on how to click through the links to join um, those activities as the day goes on. We have an absolutely incredible lineup of speakers for you today. And I wanna thank each of our speakers for giving us their Saturday, um, but not just their Saturday, because I think what we are so appreciative of is each of these speakers is so engaged all throughout the year in supporting our CMT community and our CMT patients. So we wanna thank them for the work that they do year round to support the CMT community and our mission. I also want to thank Laurel Richardson, our Director of Community Outreach, for putting such an incredible agenda together today, incredible lineup of speakers. She's an absolutely amazing ambassador to the CMTA, and we have a number of staff on um, line as well today that you'll get to meet throughout the day. Just an incredible team that's here to support you and help you and provide resources in your journey with CMT. The conferences, as you can imagine, are made possible through the support of individuals and corporations. And through that support, we're able to host activities. So I wanna thank our corporate sponsors today that made this possible. Farnext, Sidan, Allard, Psychogenics, and Stell. Thank you for your support and your funding to make this conference possible today. Morning. My name is Steve Shear. I'm a adult neurologist at the University of Pennsylvania. Oops, it's not gonna let me advance here, wait a minute. And I'll be speaking first, followed by Tanya Bardakian, who is a genetics counselor who works at, with me at the University of Pennsylvania. And the goal of our presentation is to spend about 20 minutes a piece, bringing you up to speed on CMT and then genetics of CMT. And then we are gonna have 20 minutes for questions and answers if everything goes according to plan. So I'm gonna set a timer and I'm off to the races. So I wanna give everyone a chance to sort of get up to speed with the various names and terminologies and concepts that goes with the diagnosis and, and ultimately the treatment of CMT. And for someone who's been doing this for their whole adult career, uh, I wanna introduce you to the idea that people with CMT get seen by people like me who care about the genetics of neuropathy. And through a process that I'll describe in a moment, we come to discover that somebody has CMT, we deduce that, we do an investigation to find out if we can discover the cause of their CMT, which is to look at their DNA directly and if we're able to find the cause of CMT in that person, then that actually opens a door to scientists to actually investigate why a mutation in a given gene causes neuropathy. And this is a huge step forward in, in our last 20 to 30 years that we've been able to figure out not only the gene defect, but have tools to investigate how that mutation causes neuropathy. And in so doing, we can actually make models of the disease in cells and even in rodents. And those models enable us to investigate what might work to think of a kind of CMT. And so if that step goes forward and we just heard, or we will hear about SWORD1 in the afternoon for the person on the call whose child was just diagnosed with it. If we have a model and we can make the model tell us about the basis of CMT and we can treat the model, then maybe we can even find a treatment that will work in people. And that's the goal is to bring it back to the people with the CMT. So this circle, I've been in working on various aspects of this for my whole adult life. And 
I think we are on the verge, if you hang around until this afternoon, of actually having a, a way to go from here, this last step, to a treatment in people. And so this is an incredibly exciting time to be do, working in this field because when I started, we were just on this first arrow. We were just trying to find the genes 30 years ago, and here we are all the way to trying to make sure that the treatments work in people. So CMT or Charcot-Marie Tooth Disease is just a name and all that's meant by this name when it's used properly is that it's a name for hereditary neuropathy of some kind. And there are many names like CMT that sort of, you may have heard of, you may have been given a diagnosis from any of these different names on this list, but the names aren't the thing that matter the most. It's the idea that you have a neuropathy and that there is a genetic cause of the neuropathy and a name is what clinicians give it to sort of simplify or make clearer to their colleagues when they're discussing a person with their hereditary neuropathy. So there are many names for neuropathy. CMT is one, it's the commonest one, but it's not the only one. And all of these names and, and at the end of the day mean that you have a hereditary neuropathy of some kind. So how do you figure out that somebody has a hereditary neuropathy? Well, first and foremost, if they seem to have a neuropathy when you examine them, and we'll get to that in a minute, and it started early in their life, but especially if they have other people in their family who have the same thing, then you can be pretty sure from the get-go that that person and other members of their family have a hereditary neuropathy. So one of the clues, in addition to the family history, because sometimes there isn't a family history, is to know a couple of things about the CMT. So if somebody's neuropathy began before the age of 20 to 30, and they have no other reason to have neuropathy that can be figured out from their medical history, then the suspicion that that neuropathy is inherited is very high. So if you're talking about pediatric age group kids in the first 10 years of their life, and they turn out to have a neuropathy, the, the vast majority of those kids are gonna have a genetically caused neuropathy. And so in some form or another, it, it's gonna be a form of CMT. Now we'll talk about how the nerve conductions help us discern two major types of CMT later in a minute, but even in this early age group, we're pretty sure it has to be CMT. Now what's more problematic, and maybe people on the call fall into this, are people whose neuropathy say begins after the age of 25 or even after the age of 50. And maybe they don't have a family history of neuropathy, but no other cause of neuropathy can be found. Some of those people have hereditary neuropathy. Here are a list of genes that are found in people whose neuropathy begins after the age of 25, but we're much less able to figure out for individual people whose neuropathy begins as an adult, what the cause of the neuropathy is. This is just, the field hasn't, figured this out yet. And so we're sort of stuck in finding the cause of neuropathy for people whose onset is after the age of 30. So two things that are now listed on this slide, I want to go into some detail. One is how the clinical exam tells a neurologist that the person has neuropathy. And the other is how the electrophysiology or EMG clarifies the sort of the classification or the, the kind of neuropathy it happens to be. So when you visit the neurologist, likely they use the reflex hammer, a tuning fork of some kind, this is just a fancy one, and a test of temperature and pinprick sensation. So using these three tools and also just manually testing how strong somebody is, you can determine whether or not motor weakness is present, and you can determine whether or not sensory loss is present. So in most people with hereditary neuropathy and most people with neuropathy of any kind, it's the most distal axons, the longest axons, the ones that go to the feet that are affected first. So the first change that many of you have experienced, if you can recall, might've been sort of a sense of numbness in your feet or maybe it was a foot drop that your feet slapped when you walk and somebody noticed it. And so those are manifestations of neuropathy 
that happened to depend on the fact that the axons to your feet were the longest axons in your body. And when a neurologist examined you, then they also noted that you were weak in the muscles to your feet, that maybe there was also some loss of muscle mass that's called atrophy. And when they checked your ability to sense a tuning fork or the pin prick, they noticed that your sensation was less in your feet than it was say up your leg or in your thigh. You might've lost your reflexes at your ankles, so all of that taken together says that you have neuropathy that affects motor and sensory nerve fibers. And the typical pattern is first in the feet and over time extending up the legs and maybe even getting into the hands and arms. So this is just a picture of somebody who has uh, the excellent form of CMT. And what the little red arrows point to is that there's atrophy of the intrinsic hand muscles. So there's a little loss of muscle mass here in the thumb. And you, if you look, flip the hands over, you'd lose it there. So that's the loss of muscle mass. And, and you would expect that the, that muscle would be weak and indeed it is. So that's a, an obvious motor manifestation. This is a schematic that sort of indicates that I already said that the neuropathy began in the feet, but over time it becomes more intensely numb in the feet and even the numbness will ascend up the legs. So I'm sure everybody on the call who has a sensory involvement recognizes this sort of picture of their neuropathy. It's worse in the feet, gets better up the legs and might even make it up to above the knees. And in the hands, it's most intense in the fingers and might even extend into the forearm. So this is just the manifestation of neuropathy getting worse over time and the sensory loss getting in a graded way, worse in the distal extremities and then even progressing up to arms or legs. So I wanna talk for a second about the nerve conductions because today and for the rest of the talks, um, you might hear the term CMT1 and CMT2 or demyelinating CMT and axonal CMT. So these are inference that are usually made by the fact that when you do a nerve conduction, if it's, the conduction is normal, we'll say 50 meters a second in the arms, that that's a kind of CMT where the axonal loss is the problem. Whereas people that have very slow conduction, say 20 meters a second, that's gonna be a problem where there's a demyelinated neuropathy and a Schwann cell is a problem. And even some people have a sort of in-between number and there are certain forms of CMT and CMTX is famous for this where the nerve conductions are actually right smack in the middle. So it's a more complicated picture. So this is one of the EMG's Tex arms that I like. Um, what you, they did is they we stimulate here at the wrist. You get this little motor action potential over that muscle at the thumb, the one that was atrophied in the other slide. We stimulate at the elbow. We get this up, upward deflection. We can measure the distance and we can use the distance divided by the time and we can deduce how fast the conduction was. So if the conduction is slow, then we'll say 20 meters a second, then that's demodulating CMT. And if it's not slow, then that's probably an axonal CMT. So to bring this all the way back into a picture is that CMT is when there's involvement of motor and sensory axons. There's basically 63 genes and 74 named disorders that fall into this picture where there's motor and sensory axonal deficits, and then many genes and many different names for the diseases caused by mutations in those genes. A few people on the call may have one of these other conditions that are sort of right next door to what we call CMT, but it's really the same thing. It's whether if only motor axons are affected, there's no sensory involvement at all. That's often given the name hereditary motor neuropathy, HMN, and conversely, if only sensory axons are involved and no motor axons, then you're just talking about somebody with sensory loss and that's hereditary sensory neuropathy. And so you can see that they obviously are a lot in common with CMT. It's just that some have purely sensory, some have purely motor. Most people have both. So now we're to the point where we can sort of start talking about the genes in particular. We've gone through the fact that if there's a history, especially family history of neuropathy, other people are affected. There's an early onset under the age of 25 or 30. So we're really thinking CMT. We do an exam that validates there's a motor and sensory involvement of in the arms and legs. The nerve conductions either show
I don't want to talk about the old way. Many of you had single gene panels or single gene tests 10 and 20 years ago that cost a fortune, and now we're doing a completely different way of that. So this slide sort of gives a summary of all of the people that were seen at one of the CMT centers of excellence, not only in the United States, but also in Europe. There's some 2,000 patients that were investigated to the cause of their CMT. And it turns out, and this will become a theme again and again, that the, the most common forms of CMT are this blue wedge of the pie. And that's the CMT type one. That's the one with slowed conduction. And almost everybody in this slice of the pie has a disease called CMT1A. And we'll be talking again about that in the afternoon. This is the disease caused by a duplication of the gene PMP22. So CMT1A is the vast majority of the people in this blue slice of the pie, which is the majority of people with CMT. So one form of CMT, CMT1A, is the most common form of CMT by a lot. Half the people with CMT have it. It's therefore, you know, a focus of great interest in finding a therapy because we sort of know what goes wrong there. And it also means that these other forms of CMT, the ones that are in different colors in the slide, are all there. Somebody's got to mute themselves. Leslie, you got to mute your microphone. These other forms are all rarer and therefore less known about them. And there's a considerable fraction of the pie where we don't even know the cause of the CMT. And most of these people are the adults who have an axonal CMT, and we simply don't know enough about the causes of adult onset CMT to, to fill in this blank yet. But one of the goals that we'll hear Dr. Zuckner speak to in the afternoon is how to fill in this gap, how to make this pie complete. So there's probably another 100 causes of CMT to be found. We already know 100, but there's probably 100 causes that fill in this blank. Now, what the CMTA has focused in on, and for good reason, are what's the commonest forms of CMT. So I already told you CMT1A is the most common. The second, third, and fourth most common forms are CMTX, 2A, and 1B. And so most of our efforts are focused on finding the causes and the treatments for these commonest forms of CMT. What I have in parentheses here is actually something that's at least as common as CMT1A, HMPP, hereditary neuropathy with liability to pressure palsy. You can see why we call it HNPP. This is sort of the mirror image of CMT1A. It's caused by the deletion of the gene PMP22, but it turns out that most people that have this neuropathy never see a neurologist. They never have enough symptomatic changes in sensory or motor function that they ever even think anything's wrong. And the majority of these patients are found almost by accident and they see a neurologist for something else. So I think this is my last slide. And, and the bottom line here is, is that CMT, as you probably experienced and can tell me horror stories about, is not a diagnosis that most neurologists can render efficiently when somebody shows up unless you show up already knowing that you have it. The CMT Association has made a considerable effort along with the MDA to invest effort into having people who know a lot about CMT be called CMT Centers of Excellence. And we've tried to represent as best we can the geography of the United States in this effort, such that if you get diagnosed with CMT and you want to see somebody who's particularly knowledgeable about it, you have that opportunity if you're willing to make a, a road trip. And so this an up-to-date image of what the Centers of Excellence happen to be, it's about 80% correct. But in any event, if you contact the CMTA, they will steer you towards a center of excellence that's near to you so that you can get the care that you're looking for and the information that you, that you need. So I finished almost a little early, so we have extra time for questions and that will be handled after Tanya Bardakian's talk. Thank you for coming to the meeting today. It's been my pleasure to speak to you. So Tanya, I'll ask you to 
take over. I'm going to, I think maybe I click on stop sharing. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tanya Bardakjian. I work with Dr. Shear at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm just going to take a moment to get my presentation up. <clears throat> Okay, all right. So as we all know, genetics is a rapidly growing field. And as Dr. Shear said, over the past 20 years, we have discovered that the growth in genetics has led us to know that genetics is actually playing a role in almost every area of medicine. What's important to realize is as we're discovering and answering a lot of questions, and the more questions we answer, the more questions we raise. So I'm gonna talk today to kind of give an overview of what is genetics, how does genetic testing work, and what is the role of genetic testing within the CMT community? First, I wanna go over just a couple of things where it's important to understand the difference between all of these words that you hear with the diagnosis and the type of CMT. What we say is that there's a phenotype and the phenotype is what is the clinical descriptions of the signs and the symptoms of a specific condition. And then the genotype is the actual genetic variant that is identified that causes the clinical symptoms. So one important question that you would need answered is, is your diagnosis or your family's diagnosis based on phenotype or a clinical exam and a clinical diagnosis by a neurologist or a genotype, which means have you actually had a genetic test and received a report that tells you what is your genetic change or mutation that's causing your inherited neuropathy? As Dr. Shear mentioned already, are all CMTs the same? There's dozens of specific subtypes based on clinical and genetic differences. We do know the vast majority of these genetic causes, but not all. And why it's important is that the natural history or what the disease can look like over time and potential treatment targets will be based on a large part on the specific genetic pathways, which is why it's important to try to identify the genotype for an individual if we can. So a lot of people used to ask us, well, why ask why? What difference does it make? I have CMT. What difference does it make the, what the cause is? Well, for most genetic diagnoses, the answers are varied, but they include, it can alleviate guilt and misconception. Some people think it was trauma or alcohol or whatever it may be. And it can really relieve a lot of guilt to say, no, this was a genetic change that I was born with, even though my symptoms didn't appear until adulthood. That can give relief because it's an accurate diagnosis or it confirms the clinical diagnosis. We can better anticipate what will happen over time. What will your condition look like? Although we can't say for each individual what their course will be, we can say on a whole, an individual with CMT1A or a PMP22 duplication, which is the genetic cause of that. This is what it looks like over time. We can give accurate recurrence risk when we know the exact genetic cause. What does this mean for your children, for your siblings? It can help for access to clinical trials. You have to know your genetic mutation for some of these clinical trials. And it can, assist, it can assist individuals in family planning. So with different genes, you will find that there's different natural histories, different inheritance pa uh, patterns, and we think probably different treatments in the long run, depending on what the genetic cause is. So now I'm gonna take you back to kind of bio 101. Very simply, I'm going to explain what genes are and how they work. So chromosomes are kind of like the bookshelves that store all of our genes. We have 23 pair or 46 total chromosomes. This is what they look like under a microscope in the cell, but we know how to match them in pairs. And this is important. They come in pairs because we get one from our mom and one from our dad. And then these are called the sex or gender chromosomes. Two Xs results um, typically in a female, an X and a Y would be a male. 
So to give you a schematic, in the cell is the chromosome. On the chromosome are the genes, and the genes are made up of DNA. And the DNA have these four letters, A, C, G, and T. We kind of say that the genome, the entirety of our genes, is a book. Each chromosome is like a chapter. Each sentence is a gene, and the letters are the DNA. The genes are like the instruction manual for our body. Each gene is like a recipe and needs to be spelled just so to make a certain protein. And the protein is the workhorse, which has a very specific function. In CMTs or in neuropathies, all of these genes somehow interact to make the nerve or the nerve muscle work appropriately. So an abnormal recipe leads to an abnormal protein product, either too little, too much, or just an incorrectly formed protein. So what are the bases? The most common DNA bases, there's four of them, A, T, C, and G, and they make up three letter words. Some changes are called mutations in a gene and they cause, they're called mutations because it causes the gene to malfunction. But it's important to know here that some changes in our DNA are called benign polymorphisms. That means we have some changes that do not cause any sort of disease or symptoms. It is what makes us unique individuals. And the difficulty in genetics is noting what is considered a mutation and what is just a normal polymorphism that makes each of us individual unique individual uh, people. What's important is that none of us are perfect. All of us, regardless of our ethnic or religious background, carry six to eight genetic mutations that place us at risk for disease or to have offspring with disease. So all of us have a mutation. The question is, does it result in a condition? I'm gonna take you back now to what, what happens in a genetic mutation. Literally one letter change in our DNA base can change the way the entire gene works. And I think this sentence can show very well. Changing this one letter here, the H to a B, changes the meaning of this sentence entirely. Instead of the gray cat ran down the hall, we have the gray cat ran down the ball. So changes in DNA might change the way a gene works because it just doesn't make sense to the body anymore. So before, like Dr. Shear alluded, genetic testing was quite expensive. We didn't even know a lot of genes. We found one, then the other, then the other. And genetic testing actually was done by a single gene approach. You would do one gene thousands of dollars, weeks and months of analysis, you'd get a negative result, then maybe you'd go to the next gene. About eight to 10 years ago, a revolutionary technology called panel or next generation sequencing came about where we can actually look at a whole bunch of genes that we put together on one gene panel because they have similar clinical uh, pictures. So the inherited neuropathy gene panel is an example we can massively parallel a sequence at the same time, multiple genes that we know cause inherited neuropathies. This is cost effective. Um, we can test more than one gene at a time, usually more than 20. It's very useful when the phenotypes or the clinical exam overlap. So in neuropathy, for example. And when I say it has good coverage of each gene on the panel, it means that if a gene is on this panel, that lab is promising us that that gene is looked at very closely and any variant, any change would be reported to us. What are possible results that you might get from doing this type of testing, the inherited neuropathy panel? And many of you might've had this done. So there's three possible results when you're doing clinical genetic testing, positive, negative, uncertain. A positive means the cause of your clinical symptoms has been identified. Then a genetic counselor can sit down with you and say, this is the cause. This is what it means for your natural history. This is what it means for your family members. Who is at risk? Who is not at risk? A negative result does not mean you do not have an inherited neuropathy. A negative result means we did not find the cause of the neuropathy in you or in your family. And an uncertain result means we found a change in your DNA, 
but we have no idea if this change causes a symptoms or it might be a normal polymorphism seen in the population. Over time, with a lot of research, we will clarify these uncertains. And at a center of excellence, for example, we manage these uncertain results for a long time. We keep them in special databases. Dr. Shear and I stay on top of the literature to see if these things are um, clarified over time, which we will come back to you and tell you. And then a brand new technology in the past several years has come out when panels don't give us an answer. And that is basically looking at the entire genome. We have about 20,000 genes. We only know what about 7,000 of them do. So there's thousands of genes that although we know how they're spelled, we don't know what they might be doing to our body. So we can't even analyze them clear, uh, clearly. A gene panel, like a neuropathy panel, will look at about 70 genes only. You have thousands and thousands of more. So if that first test doesn't give us an answer, we do what's called reflex. We go on to look at the rest of the genes. And there's two tests that we can do. Clinically, meaning through insurance, the only thing available is what's called an exome. It will only look at what we call the active parts of our gene. The next best thing, which is available only through research now, is the genome. The genome looks at every single letter in our entire genome. It's a lot of data. It's very hard to interpret. Um, and we're getting better at it, but it is not available through insurance, only through research avenues, which again, a center, like ex uh, a center of excellence would help with because we all are looking for new or novel causes um, of CMT or neuropathies. But it is like looking for a needle in, the in a haystack. There are thousands and thousands of letters of DNA that need to be sorted through. So really the genome becomes more of a research avenue that we're taking right now to find new causes of um, inherited neuropathies. And this brings me to a very important part, uh, point, the difference between clinical versus research testing. A clinical genetic test is your neurologist um, and sometimes along with the genetic counselor will select the appropriate clinical test. We start usually with the inherited neuropathy panel. Um, we get the diagnosis, gives us the risk information, that paper with the results are given to your care doctor and to you, and it's kept in the patient's medical record. Clinical testing can come with a cost or through insurance, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but this, is, this means it is a test for which you are guaranteed a result. Yes, no, or maybe, but the result is given to you. A research test is very similar. We usually start looking at the very focused genes, then we might go on to do whole exome or genome because we're looking for new causes that were not found on the initial test. This is often not kept in your medical record. It does not have a cost. It's usually paid for by the researcher. Um, and it is kept in the researcher's records, but does not always guarantee that you will be informed of the results. And that's important to know. So when you enroll in research, some of the questions to ask are, will I ever be contacted? Will this information be given to me? Um, and the answers are always different. So it's important to understand the difference between is this test a clinical or research test? And what we often recommend is both together because a clinical test, if you find an answer, it's great, you know your answer and you don't need to do more DNA testing um, often when you have the actual answer. So what is a genetic counselor and what do we do? The process of genetic counseling is to help people understand and adapt to the medical, psychological, and familial implications of genetic contributions to a disease, any disease, in this case, inherited neuropathy. And the process integrates interpretation of the family and medical history so that we can assess the chance of the disease occurrence or recurrence. It's to educate about inheritance, testing options, management about the condition, any potential prevention, resources and research to connect you to that. And then of course, counseling to perform, uh, to promote informed choices and adaptation to the risk of that condition. Our job is not to give you our opinions, but to make sure you're making choices and decisions about your care based on accurate information. So who should have a genetic counseling uh, appointment? And I tell 
uh, people, any individual or family who's concerned about a genetic disease may benefit from genetic consultation, regardless of whether genetic testing is available or even desired. Many people just seek information and coping strat strategies as much as test results. And genetic testing does not always mean, uh, genetic counseling does not always mean genetic testing. Sometimes we see people just to help them adjust or adapt to their genetic test result that was ordered by another provider or to help interpret test results. Sometimes um, a neurologist or a primary care doctor will order a genetic test that they're not exactly sure how to interpret and we can help with that. So genetic counselors help translate we help navigate and we help link you to support services in your community and for that specific condition. Now, what a lot of people ask me is, well, who's gonna pay for this genetic testing? There are lots of ways to get clinical genetic testing paid for. There are specialty laboratories that do this testing and they really help get prior authorization for this kind of testing. Um, most insurance companies do cover genetic testing and most people pay less than $100 with their copay and deductibles. There are options such as sponsored testing. So the MDA um, and some pharmaceutical companies do cover the cost of genetic testing because they want people who can benefit from their treatments that are being developed to have access to it. So it, there is an inherited, <coughs> excuse me, neuropathy panel available from a laboratory at no cost to patients because the pharmaceutical company is paying for it. Medicare, Medi Medicaid is covered um, for most of these if we get letters of medical necessity. Um, so it is entirely possible to get genetic testing clinically at no charge. So working with a genetic counselor can help with informed consent. We can help navigate the complexities of genetic testing options. We're well-versed well at different offerings at different laboratories with insurance or these sponsored programs. And we can help ensure that the results are managed appropriately. A genetic test is useless if you don't understand that and if it's not integrated into your medical records to help you and your neurologist care for um, your condition and to provide that information for the family. Um, and with that, I will stop sharing my screen so that Dr. Shear and I are available for any questions you might have. Thank you. Tanya, thank you so much, Dr. Shear. Thank you for excellent presentations this morning. We have a number of questions that have come through the chat function and we'll ask um, guests that are joining us today to type in any additional questions that they have. And I'll just kind of start with the first questions that came through and we'll, we'll work our way through those. Uh, the first question that came up um, was when Dr. Shear showed a map of the centers of excellence for the MDA and the CMTA and there was a red dot in Georgia and the participant was wondering what site or center that was. I think that's a question for Amy or somebody on the CMDA team. It's probably in Atlanta in Emory, but I don't know for a fact. Okay. I can check with our, col our collaborators at the MDA. I believe it's one of the MDA sites, and we'd be happy to get an answer to the, um, the guest that asked that question today. The next question that came up was uh, about X-linked uh, CMT and how that's passed from the mother or the father, and just a further explanation on that. Okay, so in X-linked conditions, if you remember a woman has two X chromosomes, a male would have an X and a Y. So typically, if the male is affected, they, that's a mutation on the X chromosome and they only have one X. So a mutation causes the full-blown condition. An affected male will not pass it on to his son because a father only passes on a Y to their son. So a father cannot pass on X-linked CMT to their son, but all of his daughters will be a carrier. So all of his daughters will inherit that mutation and be carriers and carriers can have some mild symptoms. And then a female who's a carrier has a 50% chance of passing it on to her son to be fully affected. Thank you, Tanya. Another question came up um, about options uh, patients have to not pass the gene on and to break this, the, the words were used, mm -hmm. how to break the cycle. So could you talk a little bit more about that? 
Sure, there are several options um, that we would sit down and talk to families for uh, about. And of course, there's there's adoption, there's donation of either egg or sperm, depending, depending on who the affected individual are. There's prenatal testing. If you know the cause, you must know the genetic cause um, in your family. And then there are options called PGT, which is pre-implantation genetic testing for monogenic or single gene disorders. And that would be using in vitro fertilization and genetic testing so that only embryos that don't have the mutation are then transferred into um, the female or the uterus for pregnancy. These are costly, both physically, financially, and um, require a lot of investment of time, emotion, but they're available. And um, any reproductive center that does in vitro fertilization can, can do this. But again, you must know the genetic cause in the family in order to have reproductive options available to you. And then a question came up, um, whether it's known what the mechanism is that causes leg cramping. Steve, that's for oh, you. That sounds like a me question. So <laughs> cramps, as they're medically sort of defined, are usually the problem of the nerve fibers in the muscle sort of becoming spontaneously active, like the normally when, you're, when your muscle moves, your nerve fibers are just sending a message to it. But if the nerve fiber just has a flurry of electrical discharges, it's going to make the muscle to which it's attached contract very tightly, which generates pain. Cramps are very common in CMT, and usually it's in the feet first and later in the calves. They're incredibly difficult to treat. Um, the best medicine that's ever been found for them isn't available anymore because it causes uh, a, an effect on the blood cells that made the FDA take it off the market, but that was quinine. So you can't get quinine anymore, but people are working on whether something like quinine might help. It's been a problem for patients forever. And I myself haven't found anything to work consistently well. Uh, we had a question come in about can children be genetically tested and then specifically for CMT type twos? Tatanya. Yeah, again, if you know the genetic mutation, yes. Um, however, when we're talking about um, testing asymptomatic children, there's a little bit of controversy. So I would say, um, you need to think about whether or not you feel that child, as they get a little bit older, we usually at least recommend ascent so that a child is at least 10, 11, 12, if they're asymptomatic to help make that decision, do they want to know? But technically speaking, yes, I would not do it outside of the context of genetic counseling to make sure that everybody understands the ramifications because um, that, that would be considered a pre-existing condition if you test positive if they're okay. asymptomatic, if they don't have symptoms. And we also had a question about getting evaluated or having a follow-up visit uh, with a clinician out of state and how insurance deals with that. I'll take that one. So if it's a genetics counseling thing that Tanya will have to answer, but if it's just for a routine visit, I see people who come from New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, New York, in addition to Pennsylvania, and it's pretty rare that insurance companies don't allow for their patients to be seen. There's an exceptional issue with New Jersey when you're on Medicaid in New Jersey, they don't want you going out of state. So if somebody has CMT, I just see them as a research patient because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the best neurologist for the state of New Jersey when it comes to CMT. So I can't deny people who have CMT the access to seeing me and so I just do it as a research visit and that's fine. It's not so many patients. Okay, and then here's a question for Dr. Shear. How close are we um, to developing a treatment for CMT type ones? So you should come to the afternoon session because we go through where we're at in some detail. I can tell you that there's a good model, well, so there's different kinds of CMT1, but if you were talking about 1A, there's a model of CMT1A in both a mouse and a rat. And we were, as a research project, the CMTA collaborated with a group 
a, a company really. I own this out in San Diego and we actually found a treatment that works in the mouse or rat, but the problem is, is that the toxicity wouldn't make it feasible at this point to do the same thing in humans. So we, we do know what causes 1A, we do know what causes most of the CMT1s and we have strategies for approaching them. It's just a big, there's, there's a lot of technical things to be overcome to make things safe enough to give to people. And, and that's where I think most of the concerns are right now is can we do it safely enough? We can do some things, but can we do it safely enough? And so go, go to the session this afternoon and ask the question again. Um, one of the participants mentioned that they understand CMT affects the, the nerves and sometimes the muscles. Um, does, it, does it affect the lungs? So the lungs are a muscle that are moved by muscles. The main one is called the diaphragm and, and the nerve to the diaphragm is called the phrenic nerve. And so when people have bad enough CMT, it's certainly possible that the function of the diaphragm and therefore the movement of air into the lungs can be affected. It really depends on the kind of CMT that you have, how likely that's gonna be. And the way that I handle it, and I'm pretty sure I speak to what most of my colleagues do, is I send somebody where there's a question, even a concern about lung function. I send them to a lung specialist and have them be evaluated. So you can do pulmonary function tests, which really measure the strength of the lungs as part of what they do. So that's how you get direct evaluation of the lung function. If someone gets a positive genetic test for CMT, can that affect their ability to get life insurance? So if you already have the clinical diagnosis of CMT, no, it makes no difference. It's telling you why you develop the condition. We do talk about predictive testing. If you don't have symptoms yet for any genetic condition, we do caution. There's never been proven discrimination, um, but it doesn't typically cause early death. So they're not asking that with life insurance. They're usually not asking those questions. They are asking about cancer and cardiac disease, um, but it would be in your medical records if you test positive for a gene and don't have symptoms and life insurance will access your medical records. You sign a waiver when you apply for life insurance. If it's outside of your employer, any employer sponsored life insurance is not allowed to ask. So if you sign a waiver to get your medical records, they're going to access anything in your medical records. Um, can anything be done about sharp stabbing pain? And then there was another question on just what options there are to alleviate pain. So this is a huge question and beyond the scope of what we can accomplish in a video chat like this, but pain comes in many flavors, but if we're talking about neuropathy pain, neuropathic pain, again, that's a pretty common feature of many kinds of CMT. For some kinds of CMT, it's almost characteristic and the treatments are both pharmacological, that is medications, as well as non-pharmacological, depending on, you know, things that you can do with exercise and stretching. So it's a, it's a big discussion, not a little discussion. And yes, there are things that you can try. And yes, they work to some degree. Getting rid of 100% of the pain is probably not feasible, but getting it reduced by half or a third, that's usually the goal that can be gotten to. Are there different physical manifestations of CMT? So I think the answer to the question is yes, but I would say that the majority of manifestations are going to be shared between CMT patients, the distal sensory loss, the distal weakness that I talked about. There certainly are peculiar things that happen to people that I think are bit caused by their CMT that aren't common enough to sort of be expected. So Really, that's sort of a discussion that has to happen between the CMT doctor and the CMT patient and to make a determination whether any particular issue is likely to be the CMT or is it, could it be something else? Can massage help? Only if my wife does it. <laughs> 
Sorry, I had to get a joke in there somewhere. So <laughs> yes, for cramping and you know tight muscles and all those things of physical therapy, including massage, are excellent modalities as a physical therapist would call them. So everybody on this call, everybody who has CMP or doesn't have CMP needs an exercise program that includes stretching and strengthening and, and endurance. And, and part of that program includes particularly for people with CMT, some, some active and passive stretching. It is just really gonna help you. We've had a number of questions about different centers of excellence, where they're located, who the doctors are at those centers. So um, I know we've shared the link here in the chat function and we'll also make that available afterward instead of going through all those individual questions today. Um, uh, there's a full a listing on our website as well. Maybe we can put that link up um, again in the session. Um, there was a question on how likely is uh, our hip issues with CMT1A? So hip issues, uh, specifically dysplasia, where the joint, the ball and socket of the hip joint don't form properly, is a known complication of CMT1A. Um, I think it can happen with other kinds of CMT2. It Ideally, it would be recognized early enough that some physical therapy maneuvers would be used, but if, if it goes its natural course at some point, usually people with hip dysplasia need a hip replacement surgery in order to sort of alleviate the pain that that causes. Uh, while we're on the topic, same for scoliosis. Scoliosis is definitely a, a characteristic of certain kinds of CMT. CMT uh, 4C the, the, is one that where it's almost always seen. CMT1A, I'd say it's probably problematic in about 5% of patients where they might need surgery, you know, to the point that they need surgery. But I don't know. So the, these are no orthopedic complications of CMT. So we do ask, and in, in, in a pediatric setting where you can actively hope to, you know, manage them and prevent their full manifestations of harm, uh, they're looked for and, and treated. If a patient has CMT one B, what are the chances? Is it a fifty percent chance they will pass that on to a child? Is the G is the gene known? Sorry, Tanya. Yes, it's dominant. Yeah. It's dominant. Okay, so fifty percent. Okay. Um, we also have someone that asked a question whether CMT affects the femoral nerve. So the femoral nerve is the nerve that goes to your quadricep muscle. So when you are sitting in a chair and you straighten your leg out against, you know, make your leg go straight, that's the quadriceps activation. Yes, the, the, the nerve is the femoral nerve and it would be affected, but clinical weakness from CMT to the femoral nerve would only be happening in somebody with very severe CMT. So and almost everybody I see, there's no weakness in the quadriceps. So that would be very uncommon. So if that were, especially if it was on one side and not the other, I would be looking for another cause of that weakness. Tanya, what advice do you have for patients if there's a siblings, one has tested positive uh, for, the, in this case, um, CMT2P, uh, the other siblings test came back inconclusive. So what advice would you have in those scenarios? Yeah, my my answer would be like likely a different laboratory was used, so the variant was interpreted differently. So if they are working with the Center of Excellence or a genetic counselor, um, we'd be happy to look at that. That would be my guess, is that it's the same variant but interpreted differently um, by the laboratory as pathogenic, which means disease causing or inconclusive. And that is possible because each lab um, has different experts working with them. Okay, but without more you. information, that's really all I can say. Steve, do you have any other input on that? No, I think that's probably the answer. Yeah. And then we have another question. If someone's been diagnosed with a PMP22 mutation, but testing has not confirmed CMT1A, how common is this? And I guess what, what, what advice would you have? So a mutation, we talked about CMT1A, that's the duplication of the whole gene. And then there can be, as Tanya had that example of a, a single letter change where cat became bat, 
I think that was it, but I might misremember. So if it's that kind of a change, it's, it's a different kind of mutation. There are some variants that don't cause disease. So there are mutations that change cat to bat and PMP22 that have no consequence whatsoever. They're also prevalent in, in, in the population of people so that you find them more often than you would expect by chance for a disease causing mutation. So I suspect that's what's going on. There are known benign variants in PMP22, but without having the specific variant, I, I don't wanna say more because that's, that's where the rubber hits the road. Okay, and then we have a question about whole exome sequencing. Um, testing was done in six CMT-related genes were identified as variants of unknown clinical significance. Um, can someone in a case like this still have CMT without a definitive diagnosis, you know, genetic yes. diagnosis? Yes, the diagnosis is based on a, neurolo a good neurologist's clinical exam and electrophysiology. So the genetic testing is trying to figure out why you have CMT, but CMT is based on a clinical diagnosis. And then we have another question. Um, so maybe you can speak to this in generality, but if you acquire another condition, how can that exasperate your CMT or are there other conditions known to exasperate CMT? So, and I saw another question in the chat as I was doing it. So the famous thing that can complicate CMT would be chemotherapy that contains vincristine. If you have CMT type one, 1A, 1B, and probably even some other kinds, and you get vincristine, that can be, that can accelerate your disease. It can make you much worse. And so for that reason, if somebody has CMT 1A and is, their oncologist wants to give them vincristine, I've always advised against it. I say, find another plan because we know that's gonna be a bad thing. If it's other conditions, the only common condition that I could think of besides chemotherapy would be diabetes. People that have CMT of any kind who also have diabetes, that's, that can, diabetes causes neuropathy. So the, it's sort of one plus one equals two. They have two things driving their neuropathy. And so people with diabetes typically get worse with their CMT. Okay, I think we have time for a couple more questions. And I just want to let everybody know that any questions that we don't get to during this live chat, we will respond uh, with, and follow up with you directly. Um, we have a question about um, automatic muscle twitching and how it can be treated or managed. Uh, I'm going to pass on that. I don't understand the question. Automatic muscle twitching isn't a concept I know. Okay. Do you know if ketamine treatments help CMT pain? I'm not familiar with any evidence that ketamine treatments help neuropathy pain. And then there's also a question about medical marijuana and if that can help with CMT pain. So there are individual patients who have said that it helped their pain to some degree. So I won't dispute that it can. As far as I know, there are no well-controlled studies looking at this in a systematic way that would make me have a strong opinion for or against medical marijuana in the treatment of pain. You know, until it gets studied properly, I don't think we're gonna have a real answer. Yeah. And then what effect can CMT have on the eyes? So I saw that question in the chat. There's a couple kinds of CMT that do affect the retina. So the eye thinning, the retinal thinning that you can measure with a special device uh, is characteristic of CMT2A. Some mutations of mitofusin 2 cause this condition in particular. The common forms of CMT like 1A, it does not. So it really gets down to the specific kind of CMT that one has as to whether that is a known association or a, not a real association. All right, and I think our last question um, will be, can someone have more than one mutation causing them to have more than one type of CMT? It's yes. It's possible. There are probably 20 papers describing individuals where that's happened. You don't get to pick your parents. All right, and we have a number of other questions, but I think we have a, we have a hard stop now. Yep. So we'll make note of those additional questions in the, the chat function and follow up with everyone directly on those um, after the conference. So thank you um, again, Dr. Shear. Thank you, Tanya, for your time this morning. Incredible presentation and for all the great questions from the audience today.